In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God created man in his own image, the image of God. He created him, male and female. On the seventh day, God finished all the work which he had been doing, and he ceased on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Genesis chapter 1 For thousands of years, people believed the divine story of creation, that everything on earth, including mankind, was created in seven days. However, in 1859, Charles Darwin, an English scientist, published The Origin of Species, where he set forth the theory of evolution, that all living organisms had evolved from simple life forms over millions of years. Darwin believed that mankind had evolved from a lower order of animals, including monkeys, over the course of millions of years. As a result, there was a direct conflict between Darwin's theory of evolution and the divine story of creation, as set forth literally in the Bible. Early in the 20th century, people known as fundamentalists, who believe in a strict, literal interpretation of the Bible, expressed their disapproval of Darwin's theory of evolution because it challenged the divine story of creation. That certain traditions, uh, often they're called fundamentalist traditions, work very hard to say every single word in this document called the Bible is absolutely true and we, that's all we need to do that's fundamentalism we read the word in the Hebrew it is what it says and it's and that's where we go down to that's the foundation that's fundamentalism fundamentalist politicians such as John Butler proposed laws to banish the teaching of evolution in public schools on March 21st 1925 Tennessee passed the Butler Act which stated it shall be unlawful for any teacher to teach any theory that denies the story of divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. Within a short time, local civic leaders from the small town of Dayton, Tennessee, gathered in the Robinson's drugstore searching for someone to challenge the constitutionality of the Butler Act. John Thomas Scopes was the perfect candidate. John Scopes was a teacher and football coach at the local public high school. Most importantly, John Scopes agreed to teach evolution in violation of the Butler Act. As a result, John Scopes was prosecuted for violating the Butler Act. This led to the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. Weeks before the trial began, thousands of people and reporters from all over the nation converged in Dayton. Despite the carnival-like atmosphere, the trial was significant because it was going to address the important conflict concerning the teaching of evolution versus creationism in public schools in the United States. Therefore, the greatest trial of the century brought together two of the most famous lawyers of the time, William Jennings Bryan for the prosecution and Clarence Darrow for the defense. William Jennings Bryan was a famous supporter of fundamentalism who had unsuccessfully run for president three times. On the other hand, Clarence Darrow was considered one of the greatest lawyers of all time. The Scopes Monkey Trial began on July 10, 1925. Hundreds of people squeezed into the boiling hot Ray County Courthouse. Later, due to the severe heat, the trial was moved outside. There, Darrow surprised everyone by calling William Jennings Bryant, the prosecutor, to testify for the defense. After intense questioning concerning the divine story of creation, Bryant testified, I do not think it necessarily means a 24-hour day. I think it would be just as easy for the kind of God we believe in to make the earth in six days as in six years, or in six million years, or in six hundred million years. Brian's answer shocked fundamentalists because it did not accept a literal interpretation of the Bible. Nevertheless, the jury ultimately found that John Scopes had violated the Butler Act and the judge imposed a fine of $100. On appeal, the Tennessee Supreme Court did not have to address the constitutionality of the Butler Act, but rather it overturned Scope's fine due to a technicality. Thus, the teaching of evolution remained prohibited in Tennessee and many other states for many years to come. The conflict presented in the Scope's Monkey Trial, however, it reappeared during the 1960s. In 1964, Susan Epperson, a biology teacher, challenged an Arkansas anti-evolution law that, similar to the Butler Act, was passed during the 1920s. This time, however, the issue was finally presented to the United States Supreme Court, which ruled in Epperson v. State of Arkansas that laws that prohibited the teaching of evolution violated the Constitution. 
The conflict concerning the teaching of evolution and creationism, however, persisted with the introduction of balanced treatment statutes that required school teachers to give equal time to the teaching of evolution and creationism. However, in 1987, the Supreme Court and Edwards v. Aguilar struck down Louisiana's balanced treatment statute because it violated the First Amendment. Since it advanced a religious doctrine by requiring either the banishment of the theory of evolution from public classrooms or the presentation of a religious viewpoint that rejects evolution in its entirety. The conflict between evolution and creationism, however, once again did not go away. Instead, the conflict evolved with the introduction of intelligent design, which is based on the concept that wherever complex design exists, there must have been a designer. Nature is complex, therefore, nature must have had an intelligent designer. I understand the concept of intelligent design as a way of looking around at the wonders of the universe. For that matter, forget about the universe. The wonder of the human being, the wonder of a finger. You know, it's unbelievable when you start to look at at, at, at this world, this amazing world, um, that it just is accidental. In 2005, intelligent design was put on trial in the Kitzmiller v. Dover Area School District case. Parents and science teachers challenged the constitutionality of the Dover School Board's policy that required students to hear a statement mentioning intelligent design as an alternative to Darwin's theory of evolution. Many people, including scientists and politicians, fundamentally disagree about evolution and intelligent design. Uh, intelligent design is, is an idea that actually has no scientific support at all. And uh, it's based on a, a very flawed premise that's saying we can look at something and if we can't figure it out, it must be created specially by some intelligence greater than ours. To look at intelligent design, you don't have to have a lot of faith. You have to have a lot of facts. You have to be able to understand math, and you have to understand science. And when you understand math and science, then you look at the mathematical impossibilities or improbabilities that evolution proposes, and you see that that makes no sense scientifically. In resolving the debate whether intelligent design could be taught in conjunction with evolution, Federal District Court Judge Jones concluded. My uh, belief, having heard six weeks of testimony in a trial, is that intelligent design uh, is the successor to a successor to creationism. As a result, Judge Jones struck down the policy of the school board, found that it was unconstitutional, found that it violated the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, and that uh, uh, because intelligent design was a religious and not a scientific concept, it violated uh, the Establishment Clause. The conflict first presented in the Scopes Monkey Trial continues even today. In fact, today in several states there is an ongoing debate concerning the teaching of evolution versus creationism and intelligent design in public schools. Seemingly, there is no compromise in sight for this evolving and ongoing conflict. Indeed, as Judge Jones observed, the Dover case was. Uh, another chapter of a debate that has been going on in the United States for generations. If by compromise you say a little of each, I think that that's impossible. There's, there's no room for compromise, certainly not in my classroom. There'll never be a compromise possible as long as you have adults who want to suppress open thought. I don't think there is a compromise possible because I think this is an uh, issue of basically educational ethics. That you cannot teach something as science that is not science.